Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your evening with us here today. My name is Lauren Cohen Fisher. I'm the Director of Israel Engagement at Harvard Hillel, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing both our event for the evening and the wonderful three people who I'm sharing the stage with right now um, who will be making our evening far more wonderful than I could ever imagine. Um, so thank you to the three of them for coming, and it is my pleasure to be introducing them tonight. All of us at Harvard Hillel are grateful to the Mandel and Madeline Berman Foundation, who sponsor our annual Reisman Forum in memory of Robert Reisman, who was so committed to Jewish life and thought at Harvard. We were always honored to host Bill Berman of blessed memory when he visited for these Reisman Forum events, and were very sad to hear of Madge Berman's passing away just a few weeks ago. We are hosting tonight's Reisman Forum together with Harvard Center for Jewish Studies and with the Julius Rabinowitz Program on Jewish and Israeli Law at Harvard Law School. We are very glad and grateful for these partnerships as well as all of you being here with us tonight. And so without further ado, I am pleased to be introducing tonight our moderator first, Allegra Goodman, who studied English and philosophy at Harvard and received a PhD in English literature from Stanford. She is the recipient of a Winning Writers Award, the Salon Award for Fiction, and a fellowship from the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. She lives with her family in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she is writing a new novel. Her essays and reviews have appeared in the New York Times Book Review, The Wall Street Journal, The New Republic, The Boston Globe, and The American Scholar. Her fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, <laughs> Commentary, Plowshares, and has been anthologized in the O. Henry Awards and The Best American Short Stories. Tonight, Allegra will be moderating both Ekar Karat and Saeed Kashua. Ekar Karat is the author of The Seven Good Years, Suddenly a Knock on the Door, The Girl of the Fridge, Bus Driver Who Wanted to Be God, Missing Kissinger, and The Gaza Blues. Carrot received the Book Publisher Association's Platinum Prize several times, the Chevalier Medallion of France's Order of Arts and Letters, and has been awarded the Prime Minister's Prize and the Ministry of Culture's Cinema Prize. His books are bestsellers in Israel and have been published in over 30 languages. Saeed Kashua is a prominent author and journalist, a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Kashua is known for his novels and Israeli TV series Arab Labor and The Writer. His humorous columns in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz were collated into a book titled Native, Dispatches from an Israeli-Palestinian Life. In a humorous tongue-in-cheek style, Kashua addresses the problems faced by Arabs in Israel caught between two worlds. His novels include Second Person Singular, winner of the prestigious Bernstein Prize, Let It Be Morning, shortlisted for the International IMPAC Dublin Itinerary Award, and Dancing Arabs, which was adapted into the film A Borrowed Identity. Kashua's work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, and The Guardian, among many other publications. It is with great honor that I hope you will join me in welcoming these three, and I will turn it over to the three of you for our evening tonight. Thank you. Hello. Um, it's so lovely to be here, and I guess I'm the moderator, so I will start with some questions for the two of you, and um, after, hopefully they'll talk a lot, and then we're gonna open it up to questions from the students and the audience. So, um, I just met these two. They know each other really well, so I'm the odd woman out, um, but we, um, we were just talking over there before we started, and Edgar said to Syed, I have an idea. Let's just not talk about politics at all. Um, let's, you know, nothing about peace, nothing about Israel. Let's just talk about literature. And I said, that's great. You know, I'm, I'm let's just talk shop. I'm a novelist. Let's just, let's do it. You know, and um, Syed said, um, my work is about politics. <laughs> I was worried. Just small I was, detail. I but, was worried because let's not talk about politics was what the Israelis told the Palestinians before the Oslo Agreement. So. <laughs> So um, this leads into my question, though, that I have for you. <laughs> Don't worry, it won't hurt. Um, um, so you know, there are those writers who think that um, art is by nature political, and they feel that um, they have a responsibility to make to comment on politics and society. They have a responsibility to feel to uh, speak up about injustice to advocate for certain ideas, to warn their readers about what's dangerous or sick in society. 
And um, there's a long tradition of you know, art as protest and social commentary. And you know, some of the successful ones who come to mind are people like Orwell, or further back, Jonathan Swift, or further back, people like the prophet Jeremiah, um, to you know, reference the Jewish tradition. And you know, think of those prophets who were both brilliant poets and extremely political. And then there are those writers who feel that a political agenda or even, even social commentary will kill art. Um, that artists should, that art should express a personal vision and explore multiple points of view and relish moral ambiguity. Um, so there are those people as well. And both of you work in multiple genres. You both write essays, you've written newspaper columns, you've written screenplays, um, novels, memoirs. Um, short fiction, very short fiction. Um, and I'm wondering sort of where you stand on this question. Um, I'm wondering, can fiction convey some truth about a complex historical and political situation? And can a novel or a short story make an argument that an essay cannot? Sort of where do you stand? <laughs> We did, we did that trick in the also agreement too. We let you start talking and then. <laughs> it's a it's a very problematic uh, uh, question. I've heard uh, understood the English of half of it, <laughs> uh, because then I was thinking about the first half. So what was the other, the, the, the last <laughs> sentence? I'm wondering if you find that when you write a short story or a novel, mm. you can yeah. say things about Israel or about society that you can't say in, as effectively, perhaps, in a newspaper column or in an essay? Probably the opposite is, I'm, I, I don't know about what is, what is the truth that I want to say, but the, you know that uh, the, uh, the, the politics and, and writing, uh, it's, it's, it's something that I've been thinking about since I think I started writing. I said earlier in this conversation, <laughs> That my my writing is very political. I don't, but but I think it's. I used to think yes after four years in Champagne, and it's something that I'm, I moved uh, for um, before four years ago, almost four years ago from Jerusalem, because of the political situation to Champagne, and uh, Illinois. That's in Illinois. Champagne is in Illinois. It's part of the United States of America. <clears throat> It's flat, but it's yours. And uh, so, 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 so I, 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 uh, I started to think recently about the, the, the new story that I'm trying to tell. And, uh, and then I discovered, wow, it's not, it's, not, it's not a political novel that I'm trying to tell. I always used to say that the novels are not political, unlike the, the weekly columns, and of course the use of the politics, as possible as you can in TV. You know, to use the, the popular culture or the, the, uh, the popular media in, in order to subvert somehow uh, the politics or try to deliver a, a different story writing for the newspaper. And I used to think that still my novels are very much, the background is very political, but still it's different type of politics actually. It's, it's, it's usually about the characters. But recently I've been starting to think about, I have a story to tell about something not political at all. And they thought, this is awful. I didn't know what to think about it. Because usually in, in, uh, in Palestine, Israel, and of course Palestinian writer, uh, writers, of course, yes, Adab al Mukawama, the, 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 the literature of resistance, it's, it's, uh, it's so much involved. And they usually see, even used to think that, that even Israeli writers, uh, if it's the national writing, you know, of course, also the Palestinian writing, yes, it's uh, the Palestinian writing is m much of it, or it's the, the most popular or the most known writers are the national writers, both the, the memory and the national, uh, establishing the national uh, um, identity of the Palestinians, it's much more demanding in the diaspora. So politics was always a, a very, a very um, important tool to uh, in uh, hierarchization, uh, hierarchization of of literature in in Palestinian literature at least. Of course, the same thing with also with Israeli literature, the national literature. It's still very much national. But so, so to think about art or a novel in the sake of art, I used to think in Palestine, Israel, it's in the Bamikreatov, in the best. Uh, case, case scenario. scenario, it's escapism, yes? If, if you are occupied 
by the Israelis or you're a minority, Palestinian minority in Israel, writing now a love story and thinking about <laughs> art and the sake of art is, is just being silly or playing in the hands of, of, of the government. And if you are Israeli, aware of the fact that you are occupying and ruling lives of other people and you want to write art in the sake of art, that's also some kind of not being aware and somehow supporting <clears throat> supporting the, the, the occupation, or at least the, the policy, uh, uh, the Israeli policy in Palestine and Israel. But I really don't know. I think that art should be the, for the sake of art. And, uh, and recently I was trying to, th uh, at, le at least, yes, literature. Yes, no one reads literature. But TV and, 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 and journalism is a little bit different. So recently I I've, I've, I've have this idea about this professor of ethics in the Midwest. I said, and he's not, it's not nothing to do with the with the middle with the Middle East. So am I am I some kind of a of a collaborator now, giving up my values? But then I started writing that, and just now that I need to choose the name for for my protagonist, it's it's political. Is he Arab? Is he Israeli? Is he does he have a name at all? What is his background? Is he just an American? Can I even write about American? So I cannot have, and not to mention the fact that I write in Hebrew. How can, <laughs> how can writing in details, Hebrew, details. if you are a Palestinian, cannot be political? I think that if, even if I want to do something absolutely not political art for the sake of art, with someone come from, from uh, uh, Ma Ma Mars. Mars, it will be still a political declaration. Here is a Palestinian writing in Hebrew, and he's not writing about Palestine. So for me, it's a it's a it's a it's a very complicated question, and it, uh, and politics was always involved in in in, uh, in in writing, and they still want to think that no, the novels there is no message behind the novels. Actually, no, the weekly columns and the TV were much more political and much more politically uh, um, oriented, uh, much more than the novels, but. We will see if I can, if I can, if yeah, I can we'll, do we'll see how the different. Midwest shapes you now, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Um, what about you, Edgar? Uh, well, I think that, that the, the things that I always uh, look, look for when, when I write a, a fiction is the ambiguity. It's, I, I mean, when, when I write a, an op-ed, I, I think my purpose is uh, to convince the reader. Uh, when I write a... Fiction, I, I think my purpose is to confuse the reader. <laughs> so so it, it's really, and I must say that, you know, that, uh, that uh, what drives me to write fiction is this kind of feeling of release, you know, as if I'm excused of all my duties. And uh, when I write about politics, it's this, this feeling of duty. It's like, you know, it's the difference of, of between a, making love and doing the dishes, you know? It's really, so, so whenever, like, uh, whenever I write an op-ed, I almost feel like as if I kind of abuse my, my joy of writing because uh, I kind of leverage these things that I always uh, kind of throw just to, to show how, how bottomless and complex my experience is and, and to take reality and reduce it to something pragmatic, to say, stop doing that, you know? And, uh, and uh, so for me, uh, let's say writing opinion uh, pieces is like paying my taxes, feeling a little bit less guilty. I'm a, I'm a second generation. We suffer too, you know? So, uh, <laughs> so I'm saying we always feel guilty. And we are uh, not Germans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, no, I'm saying, but, uh, uh, but being a second generation, sometimes you can cut a line in Frankfurt Airport just for that, you know? So, so I'm, so I, I, I'm, I'm saying, uh, so uh, the, the feeling, the, the, my feeling is really that, uh, that, uh, that when I write fiction, I want to avoid something clear, but having said that, this doesn't mean that when you go there, it's, uh, something political cannot suddenly emerge, you know? Uh, it's, uh, there is something, when, when I teach uh, my students writing, I always say to them, uh, a, a good story has to be uh, smarter than the person who had written it. It has to, it has to uh, pass something that you are not aware of. You know, it's like when I, when I taught uh, creative writing in the States, uh, 
for a little, a little while. Then everybody talked about writing as craft, and everybody talked about like taking each sentence and polishing it to perfection, and and kind of this kind of sense of control and creating this perfect story. And I said, "Whoa, this is how you make you you build IKEA furnitures." You know, this is not how how. I write a story, like there's something about a story that you kind of lose control, that the story takes you some someplace where you don't uh, want to go to. And I must say that, uh, that uh, uh, almost all of my stories started from a point uh, of ambiguity and trying to avoid the politics, but in so many of them from somewhere in the background, you know, sometimes even not even obvious, not even obvious to, to, the, to the reader. There was something about the, about the the politics that that that, uh, that came out, you know, I could write a story about a a, a guy who who, uh, who has a problem uh, problems with his girlfriend, and uh, uh, his girlfriend locks the door and uh, says to him, uh, "I don't want to see you. Go home." And the guy contemplates, "Should I go home or or should I?" kick the door in because I know how to kick a door in because he taught me in the army. I did it a lot of time. How would it affect my relationship? So this, it's a story about love, but but the the region and everything that you're made of always kind of finds its way and trickles in. So it sounds like you both think that, you know, the political kind of can, can emerge in, in fiction, but, but you're a lot it, more cheerful about it. Than I, I, no, I'm, I'm saying I, I, feel, I feel that there's something about it that you know that the... The, the political role, you know, there is something humiliating about it. It's like, you know, when, it, when I enter my son's room and I say to him, pick up, you know, your clothes from the floor, I feel humiliated, like he's my son. I want to say to him, let me embrace you. Look at the star. I want to talk to you about the future, about the beauty of humanity. But why does the hell, do I have to talk to him about that? You know, why can't he pick up his clothes? I would want to live in a world where, you know, as a writer, you know, I don't need to talk about that because people would do the obvious thing, you know, would not act in an inhuman way, would not uh, limit the, the freedom of other people, would not be racist, you know. So whenever I have to do something like that, I, like bothered me, I, I, I rather not, you know, but, but, uh, but, uh, but I feel as if I'm being uh, uh, pushed to it. And again, you know, it humiliates me. We're human beings. We want to talk about other things, you know. Yes, but I didn't. I have two questions. I think one question at least that I remember. There was another one that I forgot. But the first one, the better one. I didn't understand. I'll answer the other one. What do you consider <laughs> duty? Uh, making dishes or making love? I didn't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know what? If you do the dishes in my home, I replace you. You know, so it's okay. That's your wet dream, an Arab making the. <laughs> 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 The other way would be a very big problem. No, I'm just saying. Uh, okay. You no, Arabs, you know, you always have the hummus that sticks to the plates. I know that, you know, we're not there. <laughs> no, but uh, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, it, it is very much, con yes, I wish, I wish that we live in a situation that uh, uh, we can be privileged, of course, of, uh, of disconnecting ourselves from the political. But for, for me, at least, while living in uh, in, in Jerusalem, uh, each character, it's, it's, you know, being a minority and uh, a, in, in a very harsh situation. Anything that you would write about, about, uh, what, in, for example, if I want to talk to my kids, usually I do my best not to talk to my kids. And, uh, uh, <laughs> no, no, I love my kids. Uh, I think. And uh, but usually, if I tell my if I want to 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 tell my son to pick up the clothes, I know that I'm talking to an Arab kid <laughs> uh, that he needs to pick up the okay, clothes. Okay, this you leads. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just part of the daily life. It's it's uh, yeah, it was no. part of the daily life. But but of course, no literature. Again, it's uh, escapism and this political situation. Of course, the 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 the, the novel way to think about about art. It's even if you can be very much involved in politics in in an, uh, in, in, a, in you know but not in your in, in 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 your in your writing you can go to demonstrations and as you said to write an op-ed writing which is which is probably the best way for a writer to do I think maybe a privileged writer but uh, no but, 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 but you, you know what's the problem and I, I tell you the truth the problem about op-eds that uh, 
as a writer, you know, every time you want to write something new, but the situation's been stagnating for many years. And I always ask myself, like, you know, how, how the, do Oz and Grossman write so many, so many pieces about the occupation? The occupation stays the same. It's like, it's like I ran out of metaphors so quickly. You know, I want, I want the reality to change so it would be easier to write, write my, my next opens, but it still stuck there. It's true, and also they don't need the money to write op They think that they have enough money. At least I do the political writing <laughs> so, for money. So, so you're both very funny, not only on the page but in person. And I was, I was wondering, you know, and you both have a sense of the absurd in in your work. Um, and I was wondering how, you know, how you wield that, you know, how if that's if that's a tool for you to sort of deal with this problem, the duty versus the illusory freedom and the politics coming through, you know, this, through the surface. I... It's Edgar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was uh, uh, once uh, uh, in interviewed about uh, Jewish humor and Israeli humor, and my, my claim was that, the, that Israeli humor wasn't that unique, like, you know, our, our best comedy show is very funny, but it's very much like Saturday Night Live. And that the, that the uh, Jewish humor was something that, uh, that uh, existed in the diaspora when you, you were a minority, and that humor is always the weapon of the weak. You know, if you can change reality, you, can, you change it. If you can't, you make a joke about it. And they said, no, but we insist. Which, who in Israel, what, what, uh, what writer can you name that uh, employs Jewish humor? And the only name that came to, my, to mind was Said. Because really, because, uh, because there is something about, uh, about uh, the, the need to revert to humor. It's like, think about, about how many jokes people had made about death, you know? Death doesn't make jokes about people. It just convents and takes us, you know? <laughs> So I, f so I think that, uh, that humor, is, in many ways, is a way to keep uh, your dignity in a losing situation. There is a, a, a Jewish joke that is not funny. I warn you, this is the honest disclosure. I, I warn you in advance. But I think it just shows uh, how this works. That they say that a Jew goes in a, on a very narrow pavement in a shtetl, uh, and he suddenly sees like a, a, a drunk Cossack uh, walking in his direction. And the Cossack look at the Jew and he says to him, eh, eh, I will never eh, step off the pavement and stand in the muddy street for a stupid asshole. And the Jew eh, steps off the pavement and stands in the middle of the mud and he says, that's strange, I always do. <laughs> and, eh, and in the end, you know, in the, in the end, he get home, you know, with dirty trousers, but being able to crack a joke, he say, okay, you know, so, I kept something of my uh, <laughs> dignity. It's, first of all, thank you so much to call me a Jewish uh, humorist. I, I, I remember <laughs> that because, <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. I love that so much about, uh, about being, uh, first of all, I w always wanted, this is my, this is my biggest uh, dream to be Jewish. I just discussed that <laughs> with, the, uh, <laughs> with the rabbi here, <laughs> but it's, uh, but humor, it's, uh, first of all, I'm not sure about what is the meaning of Jewish humor. I think that we have, when we talk here about Jewish humor, we mean this diaspora, East European immigration kind of humor, because I have a feeling that Jewish humor in Iraq or, or Jewish community in Egypt was quite different from what we used to, to think about, about Jewish humor. And, uh, and they used humor. And also the sentence that you said just now about the humor, and they used to write humoristic columns, of course, and, and out of labor. And they love comedy and they miss humor so much, yes? So, so that, 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 the, that the humor is the, is the weapon of the weak. I always thought about that as, of course, the humor is the weapon of the weak and that's a weapon. And sometimes I thought about it as a shield. I always uh, uh, th thought about the humor as, uh, please don't shoot me, I can tell you a joke. And they have this sentences like, it's not about the humor itself. Uh, please don't shoot me, I, will I can tell you a joke. And then I will tell you another joke that maybe we can laugh together. And by the end, maybe I will tell you a sad story that you can cry. 
but 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 this I think that uh, that uh, that a uh, few years ago I thought about this sen sentence about uh, the 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 humor as the weapon of the weak, and they thought, oh my god, oh my god, the use of humor makes me weak, makes me take the position of the weak. And they don't want to be in that position. And that was painful. And I think that's the reason that they wrote the writer about this Palestinian comedian who cannot afford to write comedy, a successful comedy. And they think that humor also as a tool in, uh, in, uh, in popular media, yes, for, for, for the ethnical humor, of course, the language and the platform and who's paying the money for you to do the humor and what, what are the limits of the humor and how much even you censor your ship unconsciously when you approach the majority as an ethnic group, as a minority. So, so there's a very huge price to, 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 to pay for humor, and they think that the subversion in humor is very limited when on the, there are no political or economical or social forces supporting the message that you are trying to deliver through the, that humor. So it ends up with being just a clown the, and taking the position of the weak. And sometimes to think, uh, are they laughing with the materials that I'm trying to say, or they are laughing at me? Are they satisfied that I'm creating this neurotic Jewish characters of Palestinians in in in, in Haaretz and in in uh, in, uh, in commercial Israeli TV? That was a very painful thought, and uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, again, I, I miss humor, and I, again, it's not internal, it's not the Yiddish humor, it's not the Jewish humor. The internal Jewish humor to keep the dignity, the best humor about the shtetl and the, and the humor even during, in, uh, in, uh, during the, the Holocaust was, was internal Jewish humor to keep this humanity. But when humor is, is, uh, is the audience or you are addressing the majority, some of it can be this trying to survive with the use of humor because you are the weak. It's, um, it's very much painful. It's, uh, it's, not easy. it's sort of double-edged. Oh. Yeah. yeah, but, but, but uh, what, what I'm saying, you know, the, the, the fact that it's, it's painful doesn't make it less effective. And you, and you know, when you talk about, you say, let's say, uh, uh, the difference between, let's say, East European Jewish humor or Iraqi Jewish humor, which I don't know, I admit I don't know much. Or, they're about. not funny, they're not funny. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've read Sami Michael and uh, Balas, they're not. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> no but, but, but the idea is that what I think is that, that uh, the Asper Jew or you as an Israeli Arab have in common is the fact that, that you carry uh, two identities. You know, and I think that, that it doesn't matter, like let's, let's say when you're an American Jew or Israeli Arab, what you get from the fact that you have uh, two identities is the ability to have some kind of a two-tier thinking. You, because what you do many times, that when you, it's almost as if you write about uh, Israeli society as an insider or outsider. You speak Hebrew, you know, you can go around, pretend sometimes, you know, that, that you're Israeli. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, be some kind of a, a somebody who looks at those, those people and, and, uh, and, but doesn't move with their force of inertia. And the same things happen when you write about Arabs. Because when you go, you know, you can go around and speak Arabic, but there is something about it. You, you would write it in the Hebrew in the end. And I think that this ability of reflexiveness creates a, a special sense of humor. And, and I'm saying... There's always a, a there is, when you write, there's always a, the danger of a, becoming an entertainer. There's always a, a danger of saying, okay, what would I do, you know, to succeed? You know, I, th I think that, uh, that uh, let's say when you see an artist on stage uh, he, and, and there are many fans around him, he's both like the, the, the most powerful or elevated person in the hall, but he's also the weakest because he needs the audience. You know, the audience can just fall asleep, you know? But, uh, but uh, have, having said that, this kind of, this uh, inherent, yeah, the, guy, <laughs> the guy in the back. Are you up? <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, but, but I'm saying, having said that, I think that, that w there's something like, I mean, self-defeating about, about being human, okay? Leave, leave your national identity or all those things behind. You know, we, what, what's this idea? We're gonna write, you know, and then we're gonna write another novel and then we're gonna write another one. You know what's gonna happen in the end? You're gonna die, you know? If, and if you're lucky, it won't be with great pain. And, I, I, and, and, uh, 
And the awareness of that, uh, there is something about petrifying and painful and sad, but in the same, uh, but, uh, in the same sense, you're here and you're active and you're doing something. And you may say, if I, I, I engage humor, I take the position of, of the weak, but if you don't engage w humor, does it, w will you become strong, you know? Uh, I, I think that I think that it's all about kind of being who we are and and trying to do something out of it. You know, I've, with me, I, I always prefer to do something than, than to doing not to doing nothing. It doesn't mean that the things I, I do are useful, but at least I feel I'm trying. You know, I, when there was this movie that I saw, like you know, one one bird flew over the cuckoo nest, yes. and uh, and there is this scene there where where uh, Jack Nicholson says, you know, there is a kind of the water cooler, and he says, I'm going to lift the water cooler and break this glass wall and escape this kind of mental asylum and all the mental uh, uh, patients they go gather around him and he goes and he tries to lift it and he can't even move it. And they all burst laughing. And he looks at them and he's very angry. And he says, you know what's the difference between you and me? You know what's the difference? At least I tried. And I really think that, you know, that there's something inherently about art that it's trying and failing, you know. I think that uh, I think that when 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 you write, I, I I truly don't believe that you change reality. But the the fact that you can sometimes imagine something different or mention something different, uh, different, it's not it's not great, you know. But sometimes it's as good as it gets. No, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm so I'm so sad that he's he's talking to me and not to you. I hope you don't yeah. fall asleep. And thanks for saying that I'm going to die in the end, because what worries me most is to die in the middle, <laughs> and, uh, which, is, which is very close. <laughs> and um, I agree, but uh, I, I, it's not that I'm not trying. I'm trying. I'm, I'm just saying that how difficult. And sometimes, you know, uh, at one point of life, you think that maybe you, you, you choose the, the wrong path, the wrong, the wrong language, the wrong, the, the wrong uh, uh, strategy to do something, yes? Uh, so in that movie, you know, maybe maybe he, he could have, I don't know, found a way to break through the window in a different way and still uh, and still trying. I don't know what. And also the, the thing of being in the middle, uh, to have two identities, it's uh, it's it's not really to have two identities, Edgar. It's uh, it's it's uh, it's two identities of. Uh, it's. Uh, I think the difference. One of the, the 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 big differences between 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 being Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and being in Palestinian inside Israel is this uh, um, 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 uh, relationship with the Israelis and it's uh, the the being the, the Israeli part and the Palestinian part of our identity. It's not equal. Yes, someone is making fun of the other. Someone is feeling more superior than the other. And I don't think I don't think I cannot think about it. Takes so much effort in, in uh, uh, for this uh, um, uh, occupied occupier relationship. You cannot talk about two identities. It's two fighting identities that uh, that one feels uh, uh, racist uh, towards the other, and then the, the, the other part of your identity is 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 is, is a little bit. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, you know, if you get to this, to this situation that you feel humiliated because of your identity, that's a big problem, and that's a big problem that I don't want my kids to, to to face, and they don't have, they don't think that they can, they have any options in in uh, in Israel because they have to encounter the Israeli society, and that's very, they have to be so strong in order to realize that and not to feel. Uh, uh, less than the Israelis, and still to feel proud, because that's the that, that's the problem. And then that's uh, th that's part of the nature of the relationship uh, between the two identities in Israel. Uh, but yes, I I think that I'll uh, I guess I'll keep trying. Uh, and unlike you, to my uh, students in creative writing, I don't I'm trying to convince them to switch to business. <laughs> and, uh, so. <laughs> So let me ask you, it sounds like, you know, obviously you've thought about these questions for years and years about art and politics and your role and what, and, you know, sort of the desperate kind of um, role that an artist has, you know, it, it, it's sort of wonderful on the one hand and not that useful on the other hand. Um, and you've thought about all of these things. And I'm wondering sort of when you were very young, 
you know, young artists or young writers, you know, did you have illusions that you don't have now? Or, um, you know, how has that all changed? And, you know, has that also changed along with your politics, your, your idea of uh, sort of what a fiction writer should, should do or what a writer should do? When I was young, I met this Asaf Gavron. He's a wonderful writer in Israel. And he was, actually, he was the first one to publish a, a, a short story of mine. I was 21 or something like that in, in, a, in a book called Ototo. And, he's, and Asaf told me, you know, it, the best thing about being an, uh, a writer, and said, yes. He said, you'll be much more lucky with girls. I said, are you sure? He said, yes, <laughs> Edgar told me. So five years, <laughs> five years after that, I met. I never did. <laughs> No, <laughs> he told me. Yeah, five years later. Uh, no, actually, I, 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 and then I met uh, Saf five years later. I said, "You said it's the best thing." He said, "Oh, Edgar told me." He blamed it on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on Edgar. So, um, <laughs> well, so yeah, I, I mean, I mean, yeah. for my starting position, you couldn't get any less lucky with girls. So I guess you know it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm just kidding. That was when I was uh, young and started. Uh, um, uh, writing. I think I was naive when I started. When I began writing, I think that I, uh, I re because because I was in because l literature on books absolutely changed the way I think about things. I'm not sure in a good way or a bad way, but uh, the, I had a huge influence reading books. And oh my God, when I, I read things, I didn't know that you can write like that and you can be so mad and angry with writing and uh, literature can can change your life and. Uh, and all I need to do back then, yeah, well, I was when the first novel was published, uh, I was 25. And they thought, yes, it's just to tell a different story for the Israelis and, and will change the reality in the Middle East. It was the, the happy years after uh, Oslo. Uh, but I then, uh, I think that it was one novel with that naivety of thinking that literature can think that, uh, that can change the, the way people think and then you tell the narrative and and uh, of course, you grow up and you discover that uh, reality is much more uh, harder, and uh, and uh, and uh, and nationality and racism and uh, and identity is uh, is way much more complex than to change it by uh, by art or uh, literature. Again, that it's not supported by any other forces um, uh, in the place that uh, that uh, that we live. One other thing that I would add. When I was young, I thought that journalists and writers are wise people that earn a lot of money. That's also one of the things that I have to <laughs> realize. <with that. laughs> there are young people here. Oh, <laughs> you know, <so>, yeah. <laughs> be careful what you say. Um, what about you, uh, Edgar? Yeah, well, well, I must say, is it uh, my path was a little bit different because when I started writing, it was a. Uh, I didn't know why I, why I did it. I didn't think I was going to change the world. I didn't even think I'd get published. You know, when I would write my stories, I would print uh, three copies. <laughs> I would g give one to my brother, the other two to, to my my two best friends. And like some of the stories were a hit because cause all the three of them liked them, you know? And this was all, all, about, all about it. So the idea suddenly of kind of uh, being published and being read was I think that a uh, when I, when I started writing, uh, I used to stutter. You know, it's not that now I speak very clearly, but I, I would honestly stutter. And uh, I think there was this feeling that I felt I was kind of a misfit. I felt I was very strange. I felt that the emotions that I feel are illegitimate and that people wouldn't understand them. And, I, and there was something about publishing stories and people reading them and say, I know what you're talking about, it kind of legitimized my existence, you know, because I grew up under the thought, I thought, like, I'm strange and all the other people are normal. And then I realized that all the people are strange, but most of them know how to hide it better than I do. And uh, and for me, I must say that there was something about writing, that, that it was, a, 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 the big gift was the ability to accept myself. Hmm. How about you? <laughs> Oh, I also I shared some of your, you know, I'm going to make a lot of money, my novel will change the world and all of that, but um, but of course I grew up here, in, I grew up in Honolulu actually, um, <laughs> I say here in America, I was in America, um, United States, and um, I guess, you know, um, 
I, I've come to see, you know, when I was young and I read a lot of poetry, I read that famous quote by Shelley, which said, you know, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And now I understand that the key word is unacknowledged, you know, not, not legislators. Um, so, you know, you live and you learn. <laughs> um, but you also find your way. And I think for me, um, it's such a joy to make art. You know, it's if you're if you're making art, even if you're you know, even if you can't lift the water cooler and throw it, I I think there's a pleasure element to it which um, is often overlooked. Yeah, yeah. Think <laughs> really? about it. You you, you make a living out of complaining. You know, it's like what what could be better than that? <laughs> Let's not write it down. Just say, <laughs> do it TV. orally. <laughs> I don't know. I find the. Uh, Writing very uh, difficult. I would say it's one of the of the things that, let's say, if they pay me enough not to write, <laughs> I would do that. And uh, and the reason you could be that, like a farmer. You know, the farmers they get paid not to produce crops. Are they you could. Me? They could. That's pay my you. dream. Yeah. I, I look. I live literally in the the the, the last row of uh, houses in Champaign, Illinois. And all I can see is soy and uh, corn fields. And I very much envy the farmers because a student of mine told me that her father is a farmer and, uh, and he works half a year. And then I said, so what he does? Oh, he smokes cigar and drink whiskey. So that's, are you kidding me? But what do you think about gun control? <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> they came to hear you. <laughs> um, so I was, I was wondering, um, I think I think the people in this audience, you know, have many of them have read many of your books, but you've written a lot, and I'm wondering if Sorry each of you, that. if each of you, was recommending a book by the other, to as a first book, you know, for for the uh, people to read, what we, what you would recommend, like what Edgar would recommend of Syeds and vice versa. Uh, well, well you, you know, I got a theory that uh, that uh, when, whenever they ask me about a writer. Uh, what what is my my favorite book? Then like you know, I sometimes it's rational, but my instinct it's usually the first book I've ever read because there is something about these introductions, and you say, who is this guy? Where did he come from? You know, so so the first book I read by side was Dancing Arabs, and, and there was something about it that it was like kind of it it, uh, it kind of it hit me because there was something about the uh, about the rhythm and the sincerity and this idea of of somebody who kind of puts his life out there, but at the same time it has the, 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 the same kind of elevation of fiction that it knocked me out. Now, all, I've, I've loved all the books, but there is something about this kind of a love of first sight that you always remember the, the first meeting, you know, so. Cool, and what about you? Sinorot was your first book? Uh, uh, pipes. <laughs> yeah, Sinorot. Oh, yeah, Sinorot, Pipes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, no, I, oh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> So yes, I have it actually, and and uh, with me in Champagne, one of the few books that I knew that I'm that I'm going to uh, uh, to teach. I re I think that uh, that I recommend uh, all of your books uh, the same the same way. Really, it's uh, um, I love the short stories, and I don't have one favorite book of uh, of Edgar Carrot. So if if you need to buy books, I would. Just, I would say, buy the most expensive one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I just want to say something about, about that. It means that in a strange way, we are kind of a, we're, we're twins separated in a birth or something because we both published our first book in the, a, about the same age. We were about the same age. And, and I feel that, the, that when I a, look at the writer, and I, I, it's very difficult for me to find my, myself, my place in the Israeli tradition of writing, you know, in the sense that there are many wonderful writers, but, uh, but you know, but when I, when, when I look at the Oz or, or Grossman, you know, I cannot imagine uh, this family resemblance. I cannot look at them and, uh, and say, oh, he's my dad, he's my brother. But when I look at the... At the side, I say like, like he's my he's my brother. You know, we may be. Uh, oh, thank you so much. Uh, you no, know, so it says uh, maybe it's uh, my so my uh, my. 
Uh, well, well, let's let, let, uh, let side decide, you know, because I think I think Jewish would be better in the current situation, right? If things would change, we turn Arab, you know. Uh, uh, it it makes us both human. I don't know. He's Jewish. <laughs> Can't you tell? Look at him. He's sitting here. No, I'm just I think we should uh, open it up to the audience and let um, people ask you questions. I know yeah, people have a lot of questions. Sorry about that. We really, but I just <laughs> want to say that um, uh, that when I also, I, I love Amos Oz and uh, Grossman and Abi Yoshua very much. Well, when I read you, I think, thanks God he's not their son. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to turn it over quickly to questions. We have Rebecca Thau is in the back of the floating microphone. Amitai Buzaglo is up here. He'll be with the floating microphone. As a brief reminder for those who may have forgotten, a question is a very short statement with a question mark at the end of it. Please bear that in mind. Um, and I have also asked both floating microphone moderators to please um, prioritize student questions. So um, be mindful of that um, as you are thinking. And I'm very excited to hear all of the wonderful thoughts that you're all bringing to the room. Oh, wait, uh, so you were talking a bit about, uh, kind of jokingly about advice you give your students in your creative writing classes. What are other tidbits or pieces of advice that you really wish they would listen to or that you find yourself giving a lot? I'm not sure I got the question. Ah, oh, oh, oh advice is, uh, whoa. Uh, <laughs> so you have to pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, sold, it's, separately, uh, sold separately, sold no, separately. Uh, uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to think about. Well, again, you know, when I, I taught in the state, I really felt that uh, all the time people talk to me about the concept of the well-written story, and I try to introduce the the concept of the badly written good story. Uh, basically, kind of putting a form which is very very important in the second place, but putting a passion in the first one because. When I think about the best stories that I've heard in my life, they were not necessarily told by the most articulated people or the most well-educated people or the people who knew how to choose each word. It was, they were told by people who, who cared the most about what they had to say, who talked to you as if they were telling you something they believed was the most important thing in the world. So I think that, uh, that uh, maybe many times the challenge for, for a, a writer is really a, to find the stories that he wants to tell and not necessarily the stories that he thinks needed to be told. You know, I think, let's say, when in the States, you always have this kind of, you want to write the great American novel, you know, but usually I think that the people who write those great American novels, they just wanted to tell a story that was very important for them to tell. And I think that this, it's really important to stay inside yourself. That means that we have no idea what to teach in creative writing classes. And that's the, <laughs> one of the biggest secrets of uh, creative writing teachers. I tell my students in the first class just, if you don't tell anyone what happens in this, in this class, you got your A+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> he's my brother, but he's my evil twin brother. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm the Arab. <laughs> uh, hi, Saeed. Uh, my name is Christian. I'm a freshman. Uh, my question is, as a, as a Palestinian writer, a minority in Israel, um, how do you find, in writing about the struggles of the Palestinian people, how do you find your message and your writings to be um, uh, received in Israel? I think that uh, without my writing, there would never uh, uh, has been a peace agreement signed between the Palestinians and the Israelis. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that's. Well, uh, can, can I answer? <laughs> No, you, you know, again, you know, I think that there's something about, is there something about side that he is always the pessimist, you know? I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying, thank God you're Palestinian, because if you were an American Jew, people w would say that you were a whiner. But, you know, being a Palestinian, you got something to, com to complain about. So I, I, will be, I will be his advocate. 
I will be his advocate, and I want to say something that you know that when when uh, I'm not talking, you know, about the books that is uh, because I have a lot of great things to say about them. But uh, but when Said would write uh, the, the 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 his column every week in the Arts newspaper, basically. People who, you know, sometimes they say, you know what, uh, I don't want to read the news pages or when I read the news pages, I actually only read what uh, the editor thinks would interest an Israeli reader. They could not uh, pass a weekend without remembering that, you know, that there were uh, Palestinians living in the country suffering from racism, you know, and Saad could say, South could, could say, you know, I was entertaining them, but no, the idea is that how many... A Palestinian or Israel, I, I keep saying Israeli Arab. You know, I grew up, okay. I grew up in, in the Israeli education system. That's how we say. How many Israeli Arab writers would a, a Jewish Israeli reader read ev every weekend? You know, so whatever you read, you know, it was a statement that you exist. That it was a statement that you were human. It was a statement of what the things that had bothered you. And I think that this is of a huge importance. And that's without getting to the fact that how it affected the, the peace agreement. You know, I'm just talking about <laughs> this marginal other effect. So my writing was very much celebrated by liberal Israeli Jews. And uh, <laughs> no, I, I think it was, I th I th <laughs> it's now I feel bad for, uh, for quitting writing. But yes, I'm just uh, thinking about writing and the goal of writing and uh, and uh, if there is a goal in writing rather than just the writing itself, I don't know. I think it was I, I was successful when it comes to writing and uh, and things like that. But uh, but I really don't know. It's so confusing. What is the 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 role that you are playing for the reader? Are they reading you as the Arab? Is that just? Uh, 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 petting uh, their cleaning them or, yeah, um, cleaning, them. cleaning them or shining them. I really don't know. And sometimes I feel I'm so harsh on on my readers, thinking that I'm being just the 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 nice uh, the nice good Arab. And I know that I I don't I really don't know. It's uh, again the language, the platform, and so much politics involved, and of course the frustration of the political situation, uh, uh, it makes you think that maybe all the decisions that uh, I'm, that I've uh, took uh, uh, were just, uh, were just uh, one big mistake. Uh, to be optimistic, to, to think about uh, that one day you can reach equality and uh, is it, sometimes it feels like being naive sometimes but on the other hand you have to to understand that that i really don't know if there is a, a an equation that a writer uh, let's say a colonized or minority or persecuted minority or whatever a discriminated minority writer can write a book that it's not playing in the hand of the, um, I don't know, neo-colonial uh, market. It's, it's a very frustrating uh, uh, feeling that you're always uh, uh, playing in the head of something, that you're always, your writing is always abused for something. And it's much more frustrating for someone who doesn't believe in nationality uh, uh, that much, or at least doesn't uh, uh, see uh, national identities as uh, as holy as they are portrayed in, in Palestine and Israel. It's very frustrating. So I guess it's uh, it's just this period of time that I'm trying to to find a new way, a new language. I still don't have uh, answers, but uh, but I'm I'm working on it. <laughs> but I can say I can say you know what they, is one of those. Uh, liberal uh, Israeli writer who were happy to have Said around before he left, that the, the immediate effect of Said leaving, that you know that all those uh, crazy, mad people who would curse and uh, threaten Said, the moment he left, they started cursing and threatening me. So, <laughs> so I would like to have an, a Palestinian in the line of fire. It, would, it makes my life much easier. Yes. <laughs> I, I, thanks. But I also would like to... Uh, but I, I have to say that, uh, like here, I sound like someone who talks about, you know, literature and the importance of literature and the duty of literature and minority and something like that. 
So it, it, it appears like I have, uh, you know, values, human values or ethical values, but it's good for $10,000, you know. <laughs> if you pay me, I will go back. <laughs> I don't know. Um, hi, I'm an, I'm an American, um, and I tend to look at the Middle East from a distance. And I was on a, a committee of Jews and Arabs dialogue process for several years. And one question that I think you'd be wonderful to ask that came out of that dialogue process occurred to me is that Palestinians have a rough time, Arabs have a rough time in Israel. But how about Jews in Palestine? Um, they seem to have an even rougher time. Do you, ever, do you ever write about that or think about that? There are Jews in Palestine? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, oh, you mean, you mean the whole state of Israel? <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what I'm talking about. What? Oh, that's the question? I think they're having a good time. <laughs> I think they're having a very good time, honestly. I think that... Uh, that... Uh, of course, sometimes horrible thing happens, but uh, there is no way to compare. I think that uh, the majority of the Israelis uh, uh, accept or at least not worried about what happens in the occupied Palestinian uh, uh, territories and not even in the in the uh, the Palestinian state inside Israel for the citizens of Israel. It's just because their life is good. Their life is good, and uh, they don't have any idea what happens. Uh, 15 minutes or half, they don't want to know, to know actually uh, uh, what is happening. I think that life in Tel Aviv is very good and life in, uh, except from a, an occasion here and there to remind the reality, uh, life in Israel for the Jewish people is, 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 is good, no? Pretty good. Yeah. The West Bank? The West Bank? The West Bank is good for Jews? I, if I, I would replace the Jews living in the West Bank, uh, are you talking about the settlers? I'm talking about Jews who live in Jordan, of which there are, I think, not. Okay, I don't, I don't know that, uh, I think that the Jews in Jordan are very happy. I, uh, well, I think they have the, the best parties ever and... Uh, no, but, but it could be a startup, we, we, you know, the Jews will go to Jordan and then... We can have a Palestinian country, and all the Jews will go to Jordan. I don't know. I don't know. Next question. Uh, this is a question specifically for Saeed. I apologize. I'm going to make you make another comparison. But you moved from Israel, where in general there are some people who are bigoted against Arab people, to America, where there are people who are bigoted against Arab people. <laughs> what are some of the differences between Israeli bigotry and American bigotry, and how has that changed your experiences in the two countries? Americans think that you have to have a beard and cover your hair in order to be an Arab, and that's, um, I'm taking a lot of, like I'm abusing that till the end. So, uh, <laughs> so one of my thoughts to, uh, <laughs> Like uh, advanced racism classes, maybe to teach how <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's completely different. I have to say, uh, maybe I'm uh, maybe maybe because I'm not emotionally involved. Maybe because the states, I'm just a visitor here, and I guess that if I'm a Muslim or an Arab or belong to other American minority and I'm a citizen, and the way I looked at Israel as my state. And as a place that it's so painful for me, and uh, you know, some kind of giving up, uh, making it a better place for my kids. So here I don't feel like that. I feel I'm a visitor. It's not my fight. Some some things are, a few things are, of course, horrible and terrifying. But it's not like my. It's not. It's not my fight. I'm I'm not an Arab citizen of America. I'm not a Muslim citizen of America. Still, my major concern is about the Middle East, Palestine, Israel. To be honest, uh, 
About the kids, I have no idea. Like, as I told you, I'm doing my best not to talk with my kids. Because I live in Champagne, and you know, it's still, it's, it's flat, but it's still, it's a wonderful place. It's a, it's a university, it's a wonderful university. Uh, m my colleagues are, are from different nationalities. One of the wonderful things that I'm sure that the kids are enjoying, and actually they tell me that enjoy here, is not being the only Arab in their school or in school, it's so different backgrounds and identities. They have, they have Indian friends and Pakistani friends and Jewish friends and Israeli friends and Arab friends and Egyptian friends, and that's just a blessing, uh, living there in, 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 in this, in this uh, a very diverse uh, uh, place. Still, they are very much aware of that, yes? For example, I, uh, I didn't know that uh, at one point uh, the kids, so, so, so it's different with the kids. So for me, you, you know, I, I'm not sure, like, uh, uh, my friends are from all over, so it's okay, you know, it's uh, the academy people and their, um, uh, they, they know how to hold their racism, so it's wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but for the kids, I, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's different. They're still it's so different from Israel, but still I think, because my, 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 my daughter, she's 6'2", I, I love her as if she was my daughter, but she's 6 feet 2 and she plays in the varsity basketball. And sometimes they go just 15 minutes from Champagne to play and she comes back crying to say that people there were with Trump masks and, sh and shouting the N-word to the, to the players, to her team. And uh, it happens all the time. Or after the, the Paris attacks, like, how was it in Paris? Because they know already that she's a Muslim. And, and to be honest, I didn't know. So they are, the, the kids are now behave, being taught by the majority that they are Muslims. I remember that one day we went to this parent-teacher meeting in a wonderful school, and the teacher said, oh, Emil, your son is, after one year, less than one year, he's doing so well, and he goes to pray every day with his friends. I said, well, to pray? <laughs> like, to what God? Because honestly, we didn't know if our kid knows even if he's a, if he's a Muslim or Jewish. He went to the bilingual school. Hanukkah was always his favorite uh, holiday. <laughs> But, uh, and the teacher was so, aren't you guys Muslims? He said, yes, thanks, yeah, yes. <laughs> but we know our son knows that, and he never told us that. So I think, again, it's the, duty, the, the, the rule that the majority is, is playing in, in defining or letting you know or how you define yourself using other characters uh, uh, to, 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 to define your, your, your identity. And, and, and uh, the, my, my girl, you know, uh, she's 17 now, she's, uh, asking to go to the mosque, to the community center, to the Muslim, it's some, something that never happened there. Uh, so I think that she's pointed at, she's uh, um, as, a, as a Muslim, and then she's, she's, she, she's becoming to understand that she is a Muslim here. So we used to be the Palestinians and the, the Arabs and never the Muslims, to be honest, in Jerusalem. And now it looks like the kids are, are, are trying to understand that they, that they are Muslims. For me, it's still on TV. I'm not emotionally involved with that. And also my little boy, he's only six. He was three when we got here. He thinks he's American. He called me and his mom, you are the Arabs because of our accent. <laughs> and, uh, and actually one day, as I wrote in the, I think in one of the newspapers, he was listening to the uh, Arby's. We got the meat. And he <laughs> thought he thought that we are the Arby's. He thought that we <laughs> some kind of a, Sandwich place. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's much. I think it's it's much it's much more, more it's much easier. It's different. For 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 I don't know how what's gonna look like next week. But for now. Thank you both uh, for coming. I uh, just wanted to see if you could each talk a little bit about uh, influences that you've had uh, in styled in literature uh, in various languages. Uh, compare, contrast, you know, Arab media and Arab uh, uh, literature, Hebrew literature, you've seen both sides. Maybe, uh, you know, other influences that you've had, Edgar, I don't know if you read Arabic or, or, um, or if you've had more influence from English-speaking um, literature, if you could just talk a little bit about that. It's because I'm the Arab, I have to do all the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, first of all, I must say that, you know, that, uh, that 
uh, this is the question I get, you get asked the most when you're a writer, and uh, and I think I think that, uh, that there is something about it that when you're a writer, uh, it's important to say that your influences are not limited to literature. You know, I think that what makes you a writer is uh, could be the the bedtime stories that your mother had told you, or you know, the, or the relationships that you had with your best friend, and it's as if like. Uh, uh, the idea that that writing is affected by writing is something that uh, that I I play along with, you know, because I understand, and it's easy for me to name, you know, writers like uh, Kafka or Bashevi Singer or Kurt Vonnegut or or Faulkner or Salinger, you know, uh, uh, as writers who had affected my writing, but none of them had affected me. Uh, as much uh, as my upbringing, you know, and other things that you know that I can elaborate about, but somehow uh, I'm rarely asked about. I think that the the best writers that influenced me they start with the letter K in uh, Hebrew. Uh, so it's uh, usually if you have a letter K in your, uh, it's the the best. Uh, you'll be the very good writer. So it was uh, uh, Keret and uh, Kafka and uh, Carver and uh, Yakotsi and Knaz and... Uh, <laughs> Any good one in K. Yeah, so K, K, <laughs> K and C. <laughs> so, uh, and the Bible. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, have, I, have a, I have an anecdote about, it, about these things that... Uh, that uh, when my f when my first book came out, then you you always go to bookstores and you want to see if your book is there, but uh, you kind of feel awkward looking, you know, for your book. Uh, so I would always go to bookstores and uh, you know if, when I have to look, I ask if they have any Knaz, your sure Knaz books, <laughs> and then I look, I say, ah, oh yeah, oh yeah, thank you, uh, yeah, I come another time, and. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, one day, I, I actually I did it in a little store in Basel Street, and uh, a, 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 a guy who was my boss at the university, Ethan Green, came there, and he saw me uh, looking at the at the uh, shelf, and he says, uh, "What are you doing?" And I, I tell him, "You know, I want to see if my book is here." So I asked if they have a Knaz book. And then he looked at me and he started shouting, Knaz, Knaz, and it was really, really strange. And apparently Yoshua Knaz was passing in the street. He says, Knaz, <laughs> come here, come here. I want, I want to tell you something really funny. <laughs> and, and, it, and it was really humiliating because Knaz, Knaz is a writer I admire, and the first time kind of I, I meet him, it's just to say, so, <laughs> so. So he was entering the store, and like, and I want to say, this guy, shut up, you know. But he's my boss, you know, in university. So, so I said, okay, okay, yeah, yeah I want to tell you about your last book. And, he said, and he put a hand, my boss put a hand on my shoulder. He said, listen to that. Whenever he wants to see if his book is in the store, he enters and he says, do you have any Yoshua Knaz books? And Knaz looked at me and he says, oh, I will always do it with Kafka. <laughs> so. <laughs> But, but you're a good writer. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, the 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 question is it's much deeper than that, of course. Uh, the influence uh, uh, and the, the some kind of heritage and the dialogue and the field of literature that you think that you are fighting uh, within it's 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 a, complica a complicated situation. So for me, of course, it's 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 a mixture. I would say I, I must most of the time I'm familiar with Israeli literature and Palestinian literature, and it's two different dialogues, and and both of them are are influencing me. Yes, if I want to do something different about the the Arab character, so so of course that's influenced from reading so much. Israeli books and the way that they portray the, Ar the Arabs and the Arab character and the Palestinian struggle, that was one of the reasons that I started, I think, writing. It was in high school and reading all this Israeli literature. I went to a Jewish high school and that was the first time that I read, actually, to see a library. And they, I wanted, it was dis disgusting, not disgusting, yeah, disgusting, the way that the Palestinians were portrayed, even the left-wing liberal ones. I didn't like the way that they, 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 the, the, the Israelis uh, uh, the same way also, and, and, and the Palestinian literature sometimes, that they, so, some of it, of course, I loved very much, and sometimes I, th I thought it's too direct, it's too preaching. 
So, so, so for me, I think it will be a mixture from Palestinian literature, national Palestinian literature, and Israeli literature, which, yeah, a huge part of it. It's also national Israeli uh, literature. And I was very much also, in, um, that's for sure, influenced because by the writing of Edgar Kerrit, as he mentioned, his writing was... Was for me, it's completely different from 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 uh, Dora Medina writers. I don't know the the generation of the state they call them. This generation, it was it was it was a new voice. It was uh, it was uh, the, a different use of Hebrew. It was it gave me confidence with with my Hebrew. If Edgar can use Hebrew that way and make it so natural, so I can do that. So yes, so okay. <laughs> Thank you both so much for coming, and thank you so much for moderating. My question has to do um, first with Mr. Kashwa, how you feel about um, the fact that your writing isn't really read by Arabs, and so now that you're, in, I mean, you know, I'm so sorry to say that's what the New Yorker said. Um, <laughs> So how do you feel that this message that you've been uh, kind of trying to get out there isn't being read by the people that you are stereotyped as being part of? And now that you're in the United States, what do you want to see out of, you know, people like me who are Arab Americans? Like how, how would you want us ideally to react to the work that you're writing? And uh, Mr. Carrots, another side of that question for you, um, when you read um, Mr. Kush was writing, who do you, who would you ideally want it to reach that it's not reaching already? Um, about the Arab Americans who live in the States, I would very much like them to buy my books just like any other American, and they don't even have to read it. And, uh, but it's not for the Arabs, for anyone. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, in a, in a very strange uh, way, but that's very sure. Um, I'm quite sure about that, that my books are read by Palestinians and Arabs, uh, uh, living in Israel, that's for sure, because they are written in Hebrew. Uh, so you have the publicity. It's there are bookstores that you can buy them from, which is not the case when you are and they have wonderful friends struggling to Palestinian citizens of Israel to publish their books in Arabic. There is no market. There are no bookstores. There is no marketing system. There is nothing like a publishing house. So my few friends actually, there is nothing like uh, criticism. There is no real field of literature when it comes to the Palestinian citizens of Israel, but still, a very brilliant writer still struggling to publish their books. They pay for publishing houses. They, 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 they print their books from their own private money. They don't have editors. They don't have uh, 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 Megia, how you say? Uh, yeah, someone who's correct. Spell checkers. Spell checkers. Ah, so it's, editors, it's all right, done. Sorry. They actually draw and they um, uh, uh, design the covers for their books and still fight for, f fight for that because they're still considered like a little bit strangers for the, the some of the other publish, publishing houses, although some 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 in Cairo and some in Jordan are participating, they are col collaborating with them. But still, you need to pay publishing houses in Jordan and Cairo in order to publish your books. Uh, depends on the uh, on the copies that. So so it's sad the Arabic literature. So it's, so at least when I write in Hebrew, it's it's there. My books are three of my books. Uh, hopefully, no, not hopefully. They are available. They are translated in Arabic. Some of them uh, without, without, without buying officially the rights, and I have no problem with that at all. But the books are available in Arabic, uh, so they are there. In uh, uh, if you want to read them in Arabic, they are translated to many, many languages. Uh, the books were reviewed in Arab newspapers uh, uh, by by uh, critics who read them in, in in French or in English or different languages. So I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about the, the audience, especially when it comes to, to the novels. Probably it's much more problematic when we talk about the weekly columns in Haaretz or, or writing for, for, for Israeli TV. But the novels, in, in a very uh, uh, bizarre way, it's more available for Arabs, Palestinians, 
because they are published in 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 Hebrew. That's the sad reality of uh, of being a citizen uh, uh, of Israel, I guess. Uh, when you say who would I want to read, I, I want to say something kind of general uh, about the way I see the, the way I see literature. You know, I think that uh, that basically, whenever you read a book, you know, you read, you read a book of of fiction about a character, a character's life. You listen to another voice, then you then you exercise the the weakest muscle in the human body, which is the the muscle of empathy. Because suddenly you see life from a different perspective. You know, when we live our life, there is the guy who took our parking. There are those people in front of us in the queue. We don't care. You know, they're an obstacle. We don't want to know what they feel. We don't know, want to, to know what goes in their head. So I think that the, the effect in general of reading, the idea saying, this is how somebody else sees life. And it doesn't matter if, I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but I'm saying even if you read a book, about the life of the guy who lives in your apartment building on the other floor, you see life differently. And that's of huge importance. But the thing about it is that you can't force feed empathy. You know, you can't make somebody read a, a book if he doesn't want to read it. You can't make somebody do this kind of a, a amazing merge that happens, you know, when you read a book, that you become both you and the character and if somebody doesn't want to do that, and uh, and so so I re and I also want to say that that we are actually living in an age that somehow I'm not at least some kind of an institutional level that that actually empathy becomes more and more rare. You know, there is less and less space for ambiguity. There are like you know the, in many kind of struggles and clashes that you have, there is the us and them when you ask other people for their opinion. You don't ask for their opinion because you want to listen to their opinion. You just want to understand if they belong to your camp or if you hate them. So so I would say in a more general level, I would want more people or older people to read more books and not to read them as an, a, a forced action of getting all the words and being able to answer an exam. But to be in this situation where you have some kind of a of an open mind a, 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 to other people's view, and I, I can tell you about my personal family. Family, and now I come uh, from a family where um, both my parents uh, were Holocaust survivors. I mean, my father had passed away, and uh, we are, we are. If I have two siblings. I'm the youngest. The eldest, my my brother, he's a, a a, an anti-Zionist left-wing anarchist who started the legalized marijuana movement in Israel. Uh, my sister uh, is, a, is an ultra-Orthodox uh, with, with the age of uh, 55, has 11 children and 26 grandchildren, and it spent uh, a, a, a many of her years living uh, a, in, a, in a settlement because uh, a, with her husband uh, not working, she couldn't afford living any, anywhere else, and this was government sponsored. And with me, and you know, and uh, and often like when we, we would go to visit our sisters, and uh, then my brother would say, "This is the only time I go beyond beyond the, the 67 uh, line, and don't return handcuffed in a police car." And uh, and my, my my father always said, "You know what? Like when I look at my three kids, you know, I think that uh, uh, you're all kind of good kids and you all aiming to get to the same place. You know, you want to have a better life for people. You want to have good life. You, your sister thinks that if she prays enough and the Mazach will come, it will happen. Your older brother thinks that if he demonstrates uh, strongly enough and states his opinion, it will happen. You think that if you write your strange little stories, it will happen. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like, it's, you're good people. I'm proud to have you, you know. And uh, I think that this kind of voice is a voice that is almost non-existent. You know, it's really it's. And I can say, I can say that you know that uh, 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 I, I, it's a story. Like if I say that, I may expose somebody, but I'll take the risk. Okay, I, w I was once in a in, in a faculty 
uh, in, in a faculty uh, uh, dinner, very much like, you know, when I come here to speak, and when, when I'm in those dinners, I always look at everybody, and they, they were talking at the time, and they, they were talking, uh, it was a long time ago, they were talking uh, against Bush, and they were talking against Bush, you know, they were talking about this website that uh, shows uh, uh, pictures of apes that looks like Bush, like uh, apes and monkeys that looks like Bush. You see, you're laughing, it was very funny. Like, I mean, I bet like if somebody would do that with uh, apes that look like Obama, it would, you know, we would feel awkward, but when we do it with Bush, it kind of felt funny in the dinner. And, and I, I saw this guy who was the husband of one of the professors that, was, that were my guests, and he said, I'm going out for a cigarette. And with me, I don't smoke, but whenever Syed goes out for a cigarette, I also go out because I just want to go out, you know? So we went out for a cigarette and I said, I'll come with you. And uh, when we went outside, he said, I don't have any cigarettes. So I said, why did you say that? So he said, uh, well, I'm a Republican and my wife, uh, she wants to get tenure in, in the university and she told me to shut up you know, during faculty dinners until I get dinner, uh, tenure. But it's too much for me sometimes, I can't take it, so I always, everybody thinks I smoke, so I go out for six, when they start insulting Bush too much. But he said, but it's only for five, six more months when she gets tenure, she said I can speak back and state my opinions. <laughs> now I'm saying, as a left-wing liberal, I don't want to live in a world like this. You know, I don't want to live in a world where people a look for website where Bush looks like a monkey. I, I want I want to live in a world where people have arguments and those arguments do not do dehumanize people who do not think like you. I would want to live in a place where where freedom of speech, you know, allows people to talk about uh, uh, things and ideas that I don't agree with. And I think that all of us uh, all of us c can read books. And when I mean read books, you know, again, not to go for exam, but to read books to delve into the consciousness of people who do not think like us. You know, when I read Crime and Punishment, it's not that I said, whoa, I want to go and kill an old lady now, you know? <laughs> but, but I saw that this Russian student killer was a human being, you know? And I think that we all have a lot of exercising to do. I see that there are a few other hands lingering in the audience, but I also um, want to make sure that we respect your time and also keep to the limits um, of this room that we were given only until nine o'clock. Um, so first and foremost, thank you so much to our three wonderful guests who have been here today. It was such an honor to have you all here. Thank you so much. And to Harvard Hillel and to the Center for Jewish Studies and the Israeli Law Program at HLS and, uh, and to the Reisman Forum, to, the, <laughs> um, to everyone who helped make this event possible tonight. Also, thank you to Amitai and to Rebecca who are walking around. Thank you to all of you for bringing your thoughts and your minds here tonight, um, both rent or buy or whatever the books, but also do read them because they are wonderful. And if you're curious about how to get them, please come find me again. My name my name is Lauren Cohen Fisher. I work at Harvard Hillel. Um, if you're interested in furthering these discussions and finding someone to discuss what you've heard tonight um, or to grab coffee and think more about some of the issues brought up, please do find someone in this room, myself, um, anyone around here I'm sure would be happy to continue the conversation. Thank you and have such a wonderful night.